Hi, BookTube. Uh, Lukash over at Totally Pretentious has made a, a tag for top 10 nonfiction books. And um, I usually don't participate in these, but just because I was enjoying so much the different responses and learning about so many interesting books that I really want to read, I was inspired to uh, take this one up. So number one is a book that I have a video about on my channel. And that's a bit of a pattern. I tend to make videos about my favorite books. Um, the Dictator's Handbook by Bruce Bueno de Mesquita and Alastair Smith. Uh, this book had a huge impact on the way I think about politics. Um, the authors come from a background in game theory. So it's like a mathematical game theory analysis of politics. The subtitle of the book is Why Bad Behavior is Almost Always Good Politics. And it's about understanding the incentives that motivate and drive leaders in general. And that could be uh, a dictator, or it could be a president of a country in a democratic country, or it could be the head of a PTA, a school board or something, uh, head of a corporation. And it's about understanding the incentives and understanding the relationship between the people in power and the people they wield power over. And what are the conditions that create corruption and what are the conditions that create good outcomes. And yeah, it's, it's so clarifying. Th this question of why do some countries, why do some places have better outcomes than others is such a basic fundamental question. And many different books have addressed themselves to that question. Many of the books that have addressed themselves to that question I think are very uncompelling. Some of them are very popular books and then further critical analysis comes out that says this very popular book that everyone thinks is correct is actually totally wrong and like has fictitious data. And so you have to be so skeptical about these analyses. And also there's a sense that human beings have their own answer to this question like built in. Um, and it's very simple. Like if I'm doing well, the reason I'm doing well, my psychology, human, natural human psychology wants to say, is because I'm so great, you know, I'm, I'm, that's the reason. And if I'm not doing well, my intuitive explanation for that phenomenon is to say, because there are external factors that are preventing me from doing well, from having a good outcome. And the same is true on, on the world stage. If your country is uh, doing great, is wealthy, the inclination, the intuition is to say it's because you're so great. And if not, it's someone else's fault. Um, but we don't see that from the outside. So if a country's not doing well, we tend to assume it's, it's their fault that they're not doing well, not that there's external factors. And so getting this question right and thinking about it rigorously and scientifically uh, is, is so valuable, so important, it's so hard. Um, and, and this book does that. It does that. And, and feeling, being clear on these issues is so important when we, when we just think about politics in our own country. Like very often you see in the dialogue, the discourse around American politics, like, you know, all politicians are corrupt or all politicians uh, are, are bad for some reason or, you know, I, this politician that I love is, is, is now revealed to be corrupt or doing something I don't like. And it can cause people to like throw up their hands and to sort of remove themselves from the political process or to, you know, want to vote third party and say that what we need is just a third party um, instead of the two main American political parties that we do have. And and the book says that, no, there's, there's really complicated, but there's really important and, and significant factors at play that address, that speak to these issues, that speak to these outcomes. And the book is just like so full of gems. There's like, there's like a part of this book where he does like a side-by-side -side reading of uh, The Art of War by uh, Sun Tzu and um, like Powell, I think Colin Powell's book, I think, if I'm not mistaken, like his, his uh, modern... Uh, book of like how to wage war and obviously they're extremely different and he talks about why they're so different and what how war is waged differently in different countries um, and why and so again it's just like a study of power from the perspective of incentives from the perspective of what does power need to do to get to power to stay in power and it's it feels so sharp it feels so precise it's written by someone with a background in mathematics and it's just wonderful okay that's number one uh, promises I can keep. I don't have the book here in front of me. I took it out of the library as I do for many of my, my books. Um, Catherine Eden. In American politics, if you speak to anyone who's like right of center, um, and this is a little bit 
confused nowadays because of the whole Trump phenomenon and the way Trump sort of throws off the the political compass here. But for the most part, if you talk to anyone who's right of center in American politics, meaning like half of the American population, and you ask them, you know, what should we do about poverty? Because America, poverty in America is like really, really bad. Uh, should the government help people who are poor? You will hear an answer, like knee jerk, you know, s instantly. This distinction between like the deserving and undeserving poor. You know, do, 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 do the poor people deserve to have help? And this, the discourse in America, it's so mainstream. It's everywhere. This idea that many poor people in America, of course, this is very racialized, meaning it's, it's <laughs> this is like, this plays into racial stereotypes in a very gross way. But this idea that there are many people in America who are just happy to take advantage and leech off the government and um, they giving them handouts helping them out is uh, is bad for society and ultimately they would say bad for them bad for these poor people and part of this stereotype again very racialized gross stereotype is that uh, there's there's a population of people that have children to game the system to get government benefits um, and if not that, then at least that there's a population of people that are so irresponsible that if only they had the self-control to wait to have children, if only they were more better informed about birth control um, and waited to have children, they'd have much better outcomes. But because they choose, they have children so young, that explains their bad social economic outcomes. And so Catherine Eden and her co-author, they just moved into a very poor, I think multiple, very, very poor neighborhoods with a lot of poverty and a lot of, a lot of really high teen pregnancy rates. And they just like embedded themselves in their community. I think that they enrolled their kid in, in the local school and they got involved in like the PTA and they just like super just moved in to these communities. And they just um, did this ethnographic study and they did surveys and they talked to people and they just asked them questions um, over time after after they've sort of uh, became friendly and, and they just collected data and they collected stories in a in a scientifically kind of rigorous way and they they tell such a powerful story of these young mothers such a fascinating and beautiful story and it just changes your entire perspective of this question and, and in, in short, again, this is working from memory and working on, uh, from what I remember from the book that I've read a bunch of years ago, but, but just in short, you're talking about people who are surrounded by a lot of despair. There's a lot of trauma and there's, there's a lot of relational poverty. They, they don't often, they often, we're talking about people in general in this community who don't have good relationships with their family um, and very hard childhoods. And they have nothing really to aspire to. They don't feel like their goals are, you know, getting to college and getting a high paying job. That's just not on their radar. It's not, society doesn't offer that for them. They don't have those opportunities at all. And really their choices are, you know, betwe like between <laughs> surviving in poverty and, and like becoming drug addicted, like, the, or, you know, in, in, among the males in this population, there's a very, very high percentage of incarceration. So crime uh, is very, very rampant. Um, and it's extremely hard for women in these communities to find a reliable man, again, because of the super high incarceration rate, men coming in and out of prison. Um, just men are so unreliable and untrustworthy within this community. And it's parenting. Motherhood is something that gives people meaning. It's something that gives a person a sense of purpose a sense of fulfillment and when you read these stories it just it rings so true and it's also very very beautiful and poignant um, as like a testament to motherhood uh, to parenthood in general and yeah it's such a, a, a startling book and it it sort of speaks to the fact that we need to listen to each other's stories and not sort of uh, believe you know, the racial stereotypes and, and the dismissive kind of narratives. In a similar vein is Evicted by Matthew Desmond, subtitle Poverty and Profit in the American City. 
and it's about um, America's crisis, housing crisis to some extent. It's about, again, just the experience of being poor in America. And it's, it's horrific. It's like such a startlingly, startlingly horrible book to read. Because um, I just think poverty in America is so much worse than people know, um, if you don't experience it firsthand. And the picture that gets painted is just so bleak and so disturbing. It's, it's an important book. It's an important book. Number four is They Thought They Were Free by Milton Mayer. I recently made a video about this book. But it's just like a, a meditation on how regular people can support evil politics. And how people can be complex. And people can support evil politics without really being evil. And it's very disturbing. Very disturbing. This is the only normal history book on my list, I think. The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Uh, a really exciting, dramatic book about, obviously, a piece of recent history, which is very important to me. Uh, one of my favorite parts about this book is the author, William Shirer. He's really focused on understanding, like, why didn't anyone do anything? Which is a very understandable question. But he's specifically interested in that question from the perspective of like, the generals. The people who had the information early on to know that Hitler was a maniac and he was going to bring total ruin to Germany. And they had the, the capacity as generals to either resist or to create some sort of uh, insurrection and, and try to assassinate their dictator. And that's something he's really focused on. Like, why? Why did no one step in? And, and part of the answer is, you know, like a just moral failing, right? These are people who uh, were conditioned to take orders and therefore um, they took orders for a long time, even when they knew what they were doing was going to bring ruin. But another part of the answer, uh, <clears throat> but there's one really exciting part of the book where he goes through like a whole bunch of assassination attempts. Uh, on Hitler's life, and it reads like super interesting spy literature, and it's super dramatic. And even though you know the outcome already, and you know Hitler didn't get assassinated by his generals, uh, it was such a gripping read. <laughs> you read this like you're again like you're reading like a spy novel or something, uh, and you're rooting for these generals to eventually finally kill Hitler, and and like you know stories of like bombs on the plane and the bomb not going off or something, and super dramatic stuff. Um, really cool and obviously yeah just that history is obviously uh important to know about and it's a good a good book on that topic number six robert caro's master of the senate so robert caro is very prolific nonfiction writer i'm a big fan of his i've read uh the power broker which is like an amazing book about just corrupt local politics um and the way just politics works on the local level. Um, but yeah, he's, he's working on a four-part biography of Lyndon Johnson. And the fourth volume has not come out yet. Um, of the th three that have come out, I've only read two of them. But they're really good. And Master of the Senate uh, is such an amazing insight into the way politics works in America, the way power works in general. Um, the, just the, the importance of competence and charisma in politics. And, and one of the things Karen does so well is he's so good at, at doing history. Oh my God. Um, when he writes about the history of the civil rights movement in America, it is like poetry. Um, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. He's writing nonfiction, like a great, great fiction writer. And he talks about how in the 40s and 50s, the vast majority of Americans supported strong civil rights legislation um, that would enfranchise African Americans, that would you know eliminate the poll tax in the South, and uh, out you know make it illegal to discriminate and things like that. And a minority, a super small minority, in the Senate 
of southern states, like the southern bloc, used the filibuster to prevent any legislation from getting passed. It gives some context, I think, to like modern day obstructionist politics, modern day political polarization, modern day uh, sense that in America there's like a kind of minority of people, a minority of senators who wield an inordinate amount of power. And so just, again, that pattern of something that happens in American politics, as depressing as it is, and then eventually the way that the pattern got broken by Lyndon Johnson is very, very fascinating. Number seven is Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. <clears throat> I was, uh, I forget what class it was, some, some philosophy class or something. I was uh, tasked with reading one chapter in college from Orthodoxy, and I ended up reading the whole book. Yeah, I, f I find it to be a really powerful description of like what the religious sensibility is, what it means to live in a world that you feel is like not purely mathematical. Yeah, it's hard to explain. It had a huge impact on me in college. I think it still does affect my thinking in a lot of ways. I read it around the time that I was really getting deep into uh, Borges. And at the time, and even now, I, I do feel like there's a sort of linking between those two books, uh, those two type, those two, those two authors, um, just sort of an appeal and a kind of reflection on the mystical elements of human life and human consciousness and human existence. One of the things that I remember, now that I'm just thinking about it before I move on from, from orthodoxy is, is he talks about how insanity is not a lack of logic, but it's like an excess of logic. How it's possible to have these like logical loops that are totally sound and like totally impenetrably, irreproachably correct. Um, but their limitation is that they're like too small, they're too restrictive. Uh, he gives examples like, so the person who thinks that he's like the, the Messiah, the Christ, you know, uh, people deny the fact that he's um, the Christ. Well, of course they would you know, that, that of course they deny the, the fact he's a Christ because it's such an incendiary uh, thing to say or, or the person who thinks that people are plotting against him. Um, of course, everyone denies that they're plotting against him. Uh, that's the whole point. And so you get like these like, these like logic loops. And the problem is not a lack of logic. The problem is like, it's too constricted, you know? It's, and, and reality is much more messy <laughs> and reality doesn't work in these tight loops like that and 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 obviously this is a, an analogy for you know the religious kind of more uh spiritual sensibility um as opposed to the more like materialistic and positivistic uh way of thinking about the world okay what's next ah number eight discipline and punish by michelle foucault I have a book, I have a video of this, about this book on my channel. Such an important book for me. Um, there are a lot of really valid, really compelling criticisms of Michel Foucault. Um, one is his writing. He's an atrocious writer. He's a terrible writer. He's like an extreme kind of moral relativist in a way which doesn't really resonate with me at all. It's like way too extreme. Um, yeah, just some of his, his ideas are way out there, you know, way out there. But he's dealing with a question so well, and I think it's such an important question, and I just don't know anyone who deals with it as well and as thoughtfully as he does. And it's this question of how are human beings different in different settings, in different contexts? You know, for me, it's like the ultimate question of history. When I read about the Middle Ages or I read about the Roman time period, the Greek time period. What was it like to be a human being in those conditions? Um, not just from an external perspective, like, okay, obviously you didn't have your iPhone or whatever, but like from an internal, from, from the perspective of like consciousness, from the perspective of hu basic human psychology. And it's a very hard question to answer, obviously. And I think only Foucault, as far as I know, is like has the audacity <laughs> to really talk in these terms of like the the evolution of the human soul. Um, and again, even though a lot of what he says is like way out there and you know, you potentially problematic if you want um, to be critical of it in that way, but it's, it's, it's important to me 
also because I think he says a lot of things that are profound and are important. And it's again, it's dealing with this question, which to me is such an important question. All right, number nine. <clears throat> The Art of Biblical Narrative by Robert Alter. I'm a very big Robert Alter fan. Um, I don't have much to say about this. I actually do have a video which is on my channel, which is very heavily inspired by Robert Alter. It's the one video on my channel about um, the reading of uh, the sale of Joseph, who sold Joseph into Egypt. Um, yeah, he does a literary reading of the Bible, and it's, I find it very compelling, and it, it informs the way I read the Bible, and it informs the way I read literature, actually, believe it or not. There were, there were plenty of uh, honorable mentions in this category, in the genre, or books that aren't quite top ten, but were close. Um, among them is all my Casuto library, I'm a big fan of Umberto Casuto on, on the Bible. Uh, by Jacob Milgram on Leviticus. This is a really important book. Um, but yeah, number one in that genre and the top ten book is uh, The Art of Biblical Narrative. All right, last book on my top ten list. This is a big one. This is a big one. Man. Introduction to Komogorov Complexity and Its Applications. It's a textbook. It's a graduate level textbook. And so it's over my head. I definitely do not know the vast majority of what's going on in this textbook. But I've spent so much time, so much wonderful time, wonderful time reading through this book and trying to study it, study little pieces and, and extract little pieces. And it's so wonderful. It gives me so much joy. Uh, the main question this book is dealing with is this question of compressibility. It's what does it mean to be able to compress information? How does compression work? If you're dealing with data, again, this is very relevant in like the modern world of computing. Like if you're sending images and stuff, you want to compress images. But this is more general than just images. This is data in general. You have like strings of data. What does it mean for it to be compressible? And it's sort of, you know, you can, you can follow this in really interesting ways. So on the one hand, we, it, it, there's a very simple counting argument, which tells you that the vast majority of strings cannot be compressed. Because if you define compression as a function that like takes a string A into a string B, which is smaller, and then can, you can convert back from B to A, if most functions, if most strings were compressible, then you, you run out of spaces because your spaces for the B's has to be smaller than your spaces for the A's because they're smaller strings. Um, and then once you establish the fact that the vast majority of strings cannot be compressed, then you can prove that it's impossible to ever know, to ever prove if a string is compressible or not. And so it's, yeah, it just sort of, you know, snowballs from there into like the most fascinating kind of mathematical and computational um, ideas that you can, you can like derive proofs about the density of primes based on compressibility um, because there's like certain limits to, to how compressible strings can be and, and, like, and, and the kind of strings that you can compress and it's, it's not hard to show that these limits exist and then based on certain ways of describing primes if you could show that you will violate those compression constraints then you can prove that those ways of describing primes should be impossible. And so it's just, it's like super deep. It's super fascinating. I've spent so much wonderful time in this book and, and trying to study it. Another um, honorable mention in this category would be this uh, Dynamics of Complex Systems by Baryam, a similar kind of category of book that I've studied and had a ton of pleasure trying to um, make sense of. But there you have it. Those are my top 10 nonfiction. Uh, thanks for watching.